Hey, we are live for the first time this year. Yeah. And right. I'm not alone today. I'm not alone today. Seb is with me. And uh, we decided to actually um, talk about some fun topic. Yeah, that's great. Right. Hey, in how, yeah. how are you, Anton, today? I'm, I, I could be better. Uh, but, but uh, well, it's okay. Yeah, it's, the, the, it was the best a long day, possible, right? <laughs> Always for for all, everything for our attendees and for our fans and for Kotlin developers. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, creative coding, uh, something unusual on this channel, I think. We usually prepare the videos about the language features, frameworks, libraries, and this time, something creative. If you go and look up in the Wikipedia, it's uh, it's like they they define it. Uh, as a process without a result. So oh, really? Say creating, creative coding is is coding for no result. It's like uh, the, the functionality doesn't matter. The process and the self-esteem and everything that matters, like the process itself. So you, you do something, you code something, but you don't strive for the result. I, I, like, uh, this. But I like this a lot. Because, yeah. uh, but in fact, really... I will show you. go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, but in fact, I will show you that the result matters at the very end. Okay. So. Uh, my, I, I find this this really this really cool. I'm a I'm a big fan of the whole like creative uh, coding idea. Uh, simply because it's it's a matter of self expression, and at least for me, it's kind of a return to these like the first steps that i took with programming languages right when i when i first started programming my my initial thought wasn't oh i'm gonna build high performance scalable systems uh, that will accelerate businesses all around no i was I, I wanted to have a couple of like colorful things on the screen moving around and making me happy right exactly well, well um so we're gonna start with um creative coding topic as such as an introduction, and then we move on uh, into real life example, like code something and uh, see what what we get out of there. And uh, creative coding with um, abstract figures is a form of an abstract art. What is the most famous abstract picture with a geometry shape that you know? that i know yeah Oof. that's a that's a tough question probably like the the mondrian like the the compositions with like the with the squares the colorful ones the squares is the right word there but this one oh okay uh that's kazimir malevich the black square mm -hmm. probably the most famous picture of them all but did you know that this is just an element? It's yes, it's a picture. I mean, it's it's a drawing, but it has been used in many other drawings as well. So those who know the name and have heard that there is a square and have seen that on the internet, they usually know just this picture. There's just this drawing, but if you search on the internet, what else did Malevich do? You will find that he used this square all around his pictures, like in various forms, shapes, and 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 uh, uh, compositions, but uh, it has been used many times. And this one other thing that of, I... of code reuse. <laughs> yeah. And and one other thing that I noticed is that if you take the square, let's let's make it vector, let's make it modern, let's make it black, really black. Does it remind you of something? Especially if you start adding small elements to it, like this. <laughs> and if you add this. So actually, the ge geometric drawing is a very strong foundation for, for the design. And even like normal paintings, if, if you start uh, looking at them, you will discover the geometry. But we are going to stick with the basic shapes today. Not going to be square, but we're going to stick with the circles. Um, and why circles? Because I, I personally had a hobby. Like as a kid, I was drawing these kind of drawings and I like draw them by hand with a compass and, and ink as well. 
Uh, and and I did that like 20 years ago. And when I had a small exhibition this year, people started saying, hey, could you, you know, put those pictures on the Instagram as well? I could show these to my friends and so on. <clears throat> and when it got to the internet, people started asking very interesting questions. What do you think? What did they ask? Well, I mean, you know, you're my my first thought as a as a computer scientist will probably be something like, well, how 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 do you make these? Like, how do you? There's a th those are a lot of circles. Like, how do how do you get all of those on paper? <laughs> right. So, but the nature of the question, there are two types of people who ask. Like, two types of questions. First type of people ask, how do you do that? Or more precisely, what programming language did you use to generate that? <laughs> and the other type of people who are not developers or not the IT people, they would ask, how long did it take to draw it? <laughs> uh, so, and since I drew it and it takes, uh, depending on the picture, depending on the uh, complexity, it takes from one hour to multiple days. But uh, then I thought, maybe I can really generate that and maybe I can use some programming language, some programming language to <laughs> actually generate that. And, uh, well, yeah, I do have a lot of them. And, uh, well, if you are interested in seeing those artworks, you can find them on, on Instagram. I do have an account for that. Uh, Circles by Anton is the one. So you just go and check it out. Uh, but... Uh, I, I was thinking, like, what could I use to actually start generating those ge geometric uh, forms and shapes? And I did remember that there was a logo programming language, which, which is pretty slow for the things like this. And uh, pretty much in every programming language, there is some sort of a graphics library. Like in Python, there is a turtle library where you do turtle graphics and it's kind of almost real time it slowly draws the drawing like uh, the line the, the the small turtle goes over the window and creates this path but it takes like ages and uh, i was looking for something else and apparently uh, there is processing language which is sort of a dialect which is actually a wrapped uh java code basically it executes in an applet uh, when when you actually execute it. So it's Java, it's Swing, and I thought it will be performant enough, but it wasn't. So if I added too many shapes on the drawing, it took uh, 10, 15, 30 seconds to, to render. And I thought maybe I could use something faster. I know that professional developers, pro professional artists who generate those kind of things use OpenGL and C++ and this is not my my kind of language to go with uh, so I thought well Kotlin of course Kotlin let's try Kotlin and um, what do we have in Kotlin we have Jetpack Compose and Compose for desktop because one of our teams is actually working on this library so why don't I try that so the same drawing that I wanted to generate with processing was instant compared to multiple seconds in processing. So this is why we are going to talk uh, Compose today. But the other thing I wanted to mention, it's not the, the, the idea itself. The idea for creative coding is not, you know, uh, connected to the language. It's the idea is that you create some things, create something visual, beautiful, uh, it might be a drawing, it might be music. You can generate MIDI notes with with your loops and ifs and whatever. And so we are going to talk about Compose Multi-Platform. And I think it's a very nice topic where you get an introduction into the language and into the library. Because when I was programming those drawings or those pictures, I, I discovered I started using some of the language features that I didn't use for server-side programming, for instance, and were for something else, for data programming. <clears throat> so what what could we do? Like, it's a, it's an experimental technology, right? Right now, is it beta or alpha? Uh, do you we, know? We actually, uh, we actually are already in uh, Compose multi-platform on version 1.2 already, actually. 
So we we already have a. Oh, it's already released. So it's, I mean, it's still it's the, the underlying. Yeah, you know, the underlying technology is of course still still moving along in the same pace as uh, as Google's original Jetpack Compose. But you know, this is this is ready to use. But today we are going to use it for desktop, not for the mobile. Mm -hmm. It's just the Kotlin programming language on top of the JVM uses Compose multi-platform, the JVM version of it, and we're gonna see some results rendered on our screens. Um, do I have any more slides? No. Uh, let's let's uh, switch to the ID. And right. basically, in fact, we, we have a project wizard, but it's uh, Compose multi-platform and it generates a multi-platform project by default. So the configuration for Gradle will be with Kotlin multi-platform plugin. But if you are just focusing on the JVM version, we are not, you know, trying to create the same Android application or something for the web and so on. We are good to just add uh, the uh, the normal configuration like for the JVM without the need for, for this configuration. This is the generated one. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I created the one with the wizard, uh, which is found in, in here, right? Compose multi-platform. Single platform, desktop, and so on. Yeah, yeah. I, I suppose the nice thing when you when you have it already configured using the multi-platform plugin is, so you can of course use it on the JVM. But if you now at some point miraculously decide, hey, this should also be an Android, <coughs> you you kind of got the the scaffolding kind of already in place to to add other platforms. Right. So when you generate it, you will discover this piece of code there. Basically, that's what's generated. Maybe they have a hello world function there as well, but uh, I just removed it and added some some initial statements that we are going to explain right now what is going on here. So first of all, we start with the application, right? It's the single expression function, but it's multiple lines. That's that's funny how how it turns out. We 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 have this single expression functions feature, but our program gets to you know, many hundreds of lines sometimes uh, with a single line. Anyways, we define a window in that application. That's pretty neat. I don't have to kind of draw this window myself. I just can declare it. Here it is. Here's its behavior, it will be rendered with this size. It will exit when I click the uh, cross or the red button there, it will have a title and so on. And then we're gonna define the body of this uh, window, what's inside. And uh, there we have this material theme. Actually for very simple things, you can skip this definition but if you start adding the control elements uh it's nice to have then all your elements is going to be styled properly and uh yeah we can just by default enable this one i don't know if there are any more themes uh i've heard there are some some experimental custom so, themes as well available yeah so out of out of the box uh, there's only material theme but i know that there's some community created ones uh as well um and i think there's also some fancy stuff that's <coughs> worked on potentially for for other use cases yeah right and today what we are going to do we are going mostly draw something on the canvas so we're gonna define the canvas block and inside the canvas, the magic will happen. So as you can see, there is some sort of a modifier for the canvas. And uh, maybe, uh, Seb, you, you know it better, but I found it, maybe you can des describe it better than me, but uh, the way I say about the modifier, it's uh, styling. Yeah, I a mean, that's... that's yeah, I think that's a pretty pretty reasonable way of, of putting it. Uh, generally, like the the modifiers that you have in Compose, uh, on the one hand, you, you obviously use for for layout purposes. Um, so whether you as you're doing it right here, um, cr 
changing the the size or changing the behavior of how it how it operates in space um doing things like colors and so on uh, but it's also where if you for example have interaction behaviors if you're working with with a cursor for example um or if you're waiting for specific hotkeys uh, those things usually also come around as modifiers um, that you can attach to um to a uh, an object in your in your or to a composable in your in your compose application right so we're gonna start with a simple thing uh, we we are talking about circles let's draw a circle i mean how hard could it be like draw a circle uh we're gonna say that the color of that circle is going to be color dark gray or light gray light gray let's let's be light gray and uh maybe some radius it's gonna be in floats. Um, I think 200 is okay. Uh, then we should define the center point. Like, what is the central point of the uh, of the shape that we are going to draw, or from where it starts? And this is something that you need to adjust your thinking to, uh, because in uh, in compose we have a notion of offset. You know, like in graphics, you usually start somewhere and then say the offset from that point is going to be the point you are interested in. So the center is actually an offset. Yeah, you can see it right here. And mm -hmm. it's an object. Offset. There are some, some, you know, values or like, I don't know how to call them, the, the statics available, but I... I need to draw something in the middle of the screen, right in the center. Luckily, the the scope where we are, the draw scope, has the center as a field. Thank you. Thank you, the API developers, for that, because I tried some other graphical libraries, and it's such a mess. Like, every time you try to figure out how to find the center of the screen, and it's very nice uh, not this having is to divide everything by two or like to, yeah. Uh, yeah so this yeah. center x is ah oh, such a good thing um this center and y is what we are interested in and then we're gonna we, we can we can uh, give it a style whether it should be a stroke or it should be a dashed line or something like this but let's draw just a normal uh, circle this time. So it's going to be style. It's going to be a stroke. Stroke. Yeah. And uh, the width of that stroke is going to be, I don't know, 10. Maybe 10. So what, what we are going to see is just one single circle. Nothing special. Mm -hmm. Radius of yes. two hundred should fit nicely in a in a window with a with a width and height of one thousand two hundred by eight hundred. Yeah, so that should just be yeah, probably nice even too circles. small. Yeah. Okay. Did it draw it? Why? Hmm. I was pretty sure it should actually work. Where did we go wrong? That is a good okay, question. The modifier, the modifier, the light gray color, maybe black. Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. Um, okay. you have your, can, can you set it to do, to set <coughs> max, fill max size instead of fill max width? Oh, that's, now we also now have some people coming in at the, at in the chat. That's what's the wrong with it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is Here what we, we wanted to get. Thank you nice. for everyone in the chat who, uh, mentioned now that it needed a height. No, you are now all you know contributors to the artwork that is uh, that is being created here. Okay, but but the circle itself consists of dots, right? Of points. 
is just a continuous line when we say that we want to draw a circle. But what if we draw the circle line by line or dot by dot, like point by point? Uh, imagine let's let's uh, change our initial color, the initial circle to yellow, and now <clears throat> we're gonna uh, find some point on that circle and with uh, equal intervals, we're gonna draw the individual points. How okay. could we do that? Obviously in a, in a loop, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna write a for loop. Uh, how many degrees do we have in the loop? We have 360, right? So the uh, zero until 359 and uh, Let's keep it like that for now. And what we need now is to um, draw the points. So let's uh, let's reuse this function here. And instead of uh, drawing like a big circle, we're gonna uh, we're gonna draw a small circle with a small radius, like maybe five, like this. And it's going to be filled. Fill. And uh, it's going to be some blue color. Why not? Let's make it shiny. Uh, so currently, it's just one circle. But like we, we need to find an offset. What is the offset? And here comes the math. Here comes the. Uh, the most advanced math in, in, in this session. We, we need to find, for every angle, we need to find uh, the x and y. But we have the angle. What we need to do is to figure out the radians. We have, we have a, a uh, math, math function, function for that, two radians for the angle. And it, it takes a double, so we need to convert to a double. And then to find the x and y, the coordinates of that, uh, for, for that angle that lays on that specific curve on this initial circle, we need to um, uh, multiply the radius, which is 200 right now. Let's extract it into a variable. Uh, like this radius orbit radius that's what we are looking for <clears throat> and we need to multiply that by the cosine of the radian and that's going to be x and we need to take Take it to a float. I think the cosine is actually the math function. Like this. And it's going to be a float thing. Right. And we need to do kind of the same for the uh, y coordinate as well, but instead it should be sine. Right? The, I and think so. And and now we have the center of this uh, of the circle. We know the center of the orbit that we are spinning around. And now the x and y we just calculated are the offsets for that center. So we we're gonna add x here, and we're gonna add y in here. Oops. Yeah. So. We're going to have a new center for the next circle every time as we spin through the loop. Interesting. Let's see what happens. Mm. The moment of truth. Suddenly, our yellow circle is blue. Why? Because we actually drew everything, uh, like a, a point for every single single degree on that orbit. What we want to do is to draw a few of those points 
in blue line. And um, what we can do here is not to draw for every loop iteration, but instead we're going to step, I don't know, with some gap. Let's say it will be five, whatever. Uh, we're going to see the result like this. Uh, let me see. Run. Yay. We have some, like, we have a dashed line, right? The yellow color isn't, isn't that prominent here, but maybe we can change no, it to something it's else. It's clearly visible, actually. Yeah, no, this, yeah. this already looks great. Good. So, interesting. What, what else could we do? What if we, instead of drawing the, um, the dot, we decide to draw a full circle? Yeah, why not? Let's 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 actually expand the orbit radius a little bit because we have a big window and 200 is just too small, maybe 500. And the radius for the circle for all the circles on the orbit will be I don't know, 160. I, I One, like this because what you what you're doing here essentially is you're you're taking the dots that we just drew and you can, you're kind of blowing them up to be like circles themselves again. And since those should be circles like, that we want to see each one of them, then um, then we don't want them to be filled. We want them to be to have like a stroke style instead and uh, width of let's say one. Okay, so now we can actually see the result, how, how it changes. Boom, something interesting already, right? We don't need the, the, the orbit line, the yellow orbit line anymore, but um, do, do you see something that bugs you, Sebastian? Well, it does look uh, very machine made, I suppose. It's very yeah. It's it's robotic. If we zoom in, we can see that all the intervals are pixel perfect, right? There is no, I don't know, no hu humane mistake in there. I, there is no random. There's something that we want to break. It's too perfect, and especially if we draw a bit more of those circles, like every two uh, uh, steps. Every second step, every second circle is uh, rendered. You can see it's it's too perfect. Yeah. Let's let's play. Let's make it a little bit not so perfect. Uh, how can we do that? We can we can add some randomness. Like uh, for instance, we could uh, calculate random next next float. Maybe like this. Uh, I wonder what will happen um, if we just, you know, randomly takes flo take floats. Hmm. It feels too good still. I I can see some some randomness already. But it's almost in, invisible. Like in some places, I can see that the intervals are not equal, but still too 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 perfect. Anton, uh, I think what could you do? Camera. Oh my god! <laughs> um, uh, so while while you have a look at that, and I'm I'm gonna quickly uh, answer a couple of questions here that that came out here. Yeah. Um, one of the questions uh, from Pratik was: Does this require anti-aliasing? Um, and the answer is actually so. Compose already does so the the circles that you draw. If you're not drawing individual pixels, those are already anti-aliased. Um, so you're you're getting very smooth shapes there and and the same thing if you are uh working for example with like text that's already uh pretty nicely aliased there's a lot of people here who are of course coming up with the with the same kind of solutions of adding a little bit of randomness uh which is nice i do also like the uh the idea of 
um, drawing lines from from the center to the point uh, with some kind of animation. Uh, I think we're gonna see at least some kind of movement later as well, uh, which uh, I'm I'm excited about. Yeah. All right. So cool. welcome back, Anton. <laughs> yeah, I don't know the camera just decided to disconnect. What happened? Uh, so the next flow didn't work uh, for work for us the way I would expect it to work. Uh, instead, I would like to enforce it to choose some random number, some random floating number in in uh, some you know some interval up to some number. And apparently, in the standard library, we have next double until, actually from until as well. Like there are multiple versions of it, and if we supply uh, some value, uh, let's say until um parameter let's say 5.0 it means that we are already parameterizing our randomness and it opens up a configuration option for us from the outside so we can later add settings for that for this parameter and actually you know somehow control the randomness with 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 the properties and uh but the thing is it's only for the doubles, and we have to convert it back to floats, which is not nice, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I suppose I'm. I'm not really. I. I was. I was thinking about this a little earlier today. I'm not sure if this is something that's kind of in the nature of the underlying rendering, um, like API, like Skia, as actually some people have al already asked about or, or mentioned in in the comments as well. Um, but yeah, it's it's a little bit of a. Uh, a, a slight annoyance, but I guess nothing that's not easily worked around. <laughs> yeah, and now we can see that it's pretty random. The, now it's it's not some so robotic anymore. We we have some error, maybe too much of an error. I I would say that my my good drawings are better by hand. So five is already too much. But anyways, it's fun, and sometimes with this kind of uh, artwork. Uh, if you go to the extremes, it, you get actually uh, much more interesting results. Let's let's do some cra something crazy enough, like uh, raise it up to, up to fifty instead. What All will right, happen? Now I'm more? curious. It's gonna it's gonna be interesting. Yeah, it gets hairy. Okay. Yeah. Now, now this already at least at least at this size, it kind of it reminds me a little bit of like just maybe my old college notebook or something. Especially in the blue, it kind of feels like uh just having like doodled with a pen while like having a conversation or something like this. It is definitely now very organic. <laughs> yeah. So if, but but uh, it still follows the idea, right? There is a circle, the orbit. And we are moving and drawing the uh, objects around the orbit, which is actually a mathematical formula. It's it's a circle, right? And you can actually make up your own rules. You can say, okay, I, I'm going to define the entry point. Let it be 0 and 0 for x and y. And then I'm going to increase x by 1 and increase y by 2 on each step. And... This way, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw a line, like a dashed line. But it, the formula could be everything. So the way this way you can actually create fractals. This way you can actually even have some sort of an image as a parameter. You just calculate what's the surrounding neighborhood RGB, the 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 average RGB is, and you draw a, a pixel that is or a, a circle on top of those pixels on the picture and you get some pixelized uh, drawing that reminds you of the original, but is kind of post-processed. It's not Wait. a Photoshop, but it's, it's, it, it's a cool effect, I think. So you, you can actually come up with your own rules, how you draw the objects, the shapes, the orientation, the, uh, the color. We can generate the colors. We can make this picture just randomly colorful. Uh, but anyways, it would be fun if, if I change some parameters the way I did now. Every time I have to restart the application to see the effect. And that's kind of annoying. I want to get the immediate result. Like I want to experiment with the radius, like stretch it, shrink it. Maybe I want to have two shapes on top of each other. 
and 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 therefore we can we can actually use uh, some controls or the APIs from uh, the compose library to add those parameters into our application into our rules. And uh, I actually have prepared a small example for you here uh, that is already on GitHub. I'm, I'm going to show how to find it. Um, uh, let me let me find where where do I have do I have some sort of uh, I have to say, I'm very I'm very curious about how this is uh, how this is gonna work uh, because your the the thing that you already showed like I I noticed that when the window opened right uh, that yeah. the 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 image appeared almost instantaneously but I think now if we're if we're gonna add some sliders or some kind of configuration uh, then that's kind of then we'll really see how interactive it is or how long it really takes to render. Right. So if our uh, attendees are, are curious, uh, they can find this repository composed for desktop samples. Probably the name the name is not too descriptive. I should put some creative coding in there. But uh, anyways, you can find some of the samples that are complete under the source directory, and some of the samples are not complete. The no, this one is complete. Um, like the seed of life, for instance. So I have a to do there. So if you want to contribute and uh, you know add some uh, add some samples into my repository with this template, you know uh, you are free to do so. I'm very happy to accept the PRs. But today we are going to look into this circle of circles with settings sample, slightly bigger one. Are we gonna use some of interesting APIs in there? And I already have it open in my ID. Uh, let's see. Uh, not this one, not this window, but this window. So the initial idea is kind of the same. I'm going to draw uh, a circle of circles. So we, get, we have circles around the orbit. And then I'm adding some components that control those parameters, the, 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 uh, the amount of circles. <coughs> <clears throat> in the orbit, the uh, radius of the orbit, something else. Let me show you. Let, let's execute the application and see uh, what it really is. And then we can start uh, with, uh, with the source code browsing. OK, sounds excellent. Good. So here's the application. We have two orbits, one on top of each other. Uh, one on, on top of the other one. We can switch them off individually, like this. The other one, just basic shapes, no colors right now. Um, we can play with the ra radius. For the orbits, I'm, I'm changing the radius for both of them, so it's a global parameter. And then we can uh, redefine the number of steps or skips for each of them, like in the for loop, right? I, I could, wasn't too creative. Could you zoom in just a little numbers. bit, perhaps, um, just so that people... Oh. I, I know that most likely uh, these beautiful images are going to suffer a little bit from uh, stream compression. Um, but, you know, at least this way, people yeah. get to see them in as close of their glory as possible. So, right. So let's let's play with the individual parameters, like one by one. So the orbit's radius we have seen already. I don't know how smooth it looks like in the stream, but for me on my screen, it just moves like like an animation. There is no lag at all. There's like the as I change the slider parameter, it just changes the whole the the, the whole picture, the whole uh, canvas at once. There is like no lag at all. Uh, Number of steps in the for loop, or actually between the circles, I can change the number. Actually, it's like an interval. It's it's not a number of circles on the orbit. It's the more you, uh, the greater the value is, the less circles you have. So at the very end, 360, you're going to have one circle. So it's inverted. Yeah, I mean it's it's literally the the, the step variable that that we saw in the yeah. in the previous code, right? 
right so i'm i'm just passing it in directly without any any changes mm -hmm. now the steps for the outer one the same way okay yeah. we That's we can play with the obvious. radius for the inner orbit and for the outer orbit as well and the most fun parameter i think of them all is the random so if we start changing that okay now it starts getting wobbly now it looks like a pencil sketch yeah this way it's really it really is like a uh, handmade drawing still follows the same rules right we have an orbit we have circles i haven't played with the radius randomness actually because sometimes uh, well if you're compass is not too good you your your compass is going to change the radius depending on the pressure you're putting on 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 the paper so oh. we could play with that as well yeah wow yeah uh one point that uh someone here asked is is the <coughs> material theme informing the the user interface and i guess the answer to that one is yes so by by default out of the box currently uh, you are getting, um, Anton also showed this briefly beforehand, there's this material theme kind of block that you open up, which takes care of, of this kind of default theming. Now, of course, uh, it's understandable that not everyone uh, is the, the biggest fan of seeing material theme on, on desktop. So there are uh, other uh, efforts underway to bring, uh, to bring different themes to, um, to compose for desktop. One of them actually being uh, Jewel by by JetBrains, so that that's library J E W E L Jewel, um, which tries to bring the IntelliJ look and feel uh, into your Compose for desktop applications. Uh, Anton, I think we've lost your camera again, so I'll just give you a little bit of time to uh, play with your with your. Oh, there you are. Okay. Yeah, I uh, think the external camera is overheating on me, so. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, you know, with the, the show goes on somehow, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Sasha Nozick also asks uh, or says, I was doing some performance tests uh, from Maps KT and several thousands of elements are completely smooth. So that's also exciting to hear. All of these, I think, give give a very good indication that if you want like some want to play with stuff in, in near real time, then actually Compose for Desktop is uh, quite a good choice. Yeah. So very pleasant experience i would say like uh, the api and and the uh the rendering performance is, is great so let's let's dive into what we have in the source code like there are some interesting features like we of course we start with the application again and we we have this window defined window block and then uh we have canvas somewhere uh, and the way we organized our application is like a split screen. On the left, we have the canvas. On the right, we have the settings panel. Uh, but then we have some interesting things in here, like this line, for instance. Um, this is a settings variable. Basically, it's a data object, like data class, where we have all those parameters, uh, we are holding holding them from like they're receiving the event from uh, changing slider, setting the new version of settings to the canvas or to the uh, controller. Let's call it a controller into our application, and then the the uh, the canvas are re-rendered, right, with the new values and uh, with the new radiuses, whatever, with the new random uh, coefficient as well. Mm -hmm. So what happens here, we have, like, if if the outer orbit is the one we want to draw or render, then we call the, the function. If we don't want to call it or we don't want to draw it, we just don't call the function and so on. So settings are just, you know, the parameters and then our rendering and logic applies according to the settings. Uh, one interesting thing for me was the way you manage the state in Compose. And I would say, I, I, I still don't really understand how it works. I just copy and paste stuff. But this remember function tells me, hey, yeah, probably you're going to be working with the state. 
And the other thing is, I, I, like I haven't used before i i knew about this language feature obviously and but i haven't really used it before the delegate the by delegate uh and what was interesting that in one of the samples i had two lines like this and one of them was with the delegate and the other one was the like assignment operation and then they behave differently and that was strange uh so can you can you can you somehow explain it better than me like because for me it's something that is very hectic uh, like I, I i'm not even, even sure i have a good explanation for this kind of thing sure yeah so with the um th this is always a fun <coughs> part i mean there, there there's there's a couple of moving bits and pieces here that that are probably worth worth talking about first of all of course the the whole idea of having this remember function mutable state um is uh, is born out of the necessity that that compose uh is declarative right so you're you're kind of just you're you're just kind of saying given a specific state uh this is what my ui should look like right if i want to draw my outer orbit uh or if the outer orbit is supposed to be drawn then this is where the outer orbit goes okay so nothing uh nothing really too crazy so far there um what's maybe a little bit more interesting here then uh, or or as as you said before and is that we have this by keyword um and really what you can what you can think about uh or what you can think of when you when you do this is just um like under the hood uh this allows you to kind of unwrap whatever object remember gives you back uh, and provide like a a nice little proxy um to uh, both set uh, and get values back so the way that i like to usually think about this is uh by turning on the inlay hints um, because then i actually know what's going on under the hood so if you want to just quickly go into the intellij idea preferences um, and turn those on yeah under types there um, then uh, we can see that remember by default uh, gives us this settings object right now if you have uh, another version um, that has the equals then you can see we're getting this mutable state of settings uh, so you can you can tell that the API really gives you back something that's that's wrapped in 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 like another API, um, and then using the by keyword, it's a little bit of syntactic sugar, um, which essentially means if I'm using the equal sign to to assign something, or if I'm just accessing this variable under the hood, I'm calling the get uh, get value and set value functions, which mm -hmm. uh, is just a little bit it's a little bit smoother. Right. But one thing I noticed also, like when experimenting with it, uh, when I was just either rewriting the code or uh, copy pasting it from so somewhere else, what happened is that I didn't have this set value function imported, and this thing did not compile. And it wasn't immediately obvious what is going on. Why doesn't it compile? Because I'm not using a set set value in, in here anywhere and the this uh error message it, it's a correct one but it's kind of it doesn't help because it says like there has it has no method set value yeah but i'm I not using they, it i think they made it a, luckily they made it a little bit more more understandable now uh that it you know now that it actually prompts you to import the extension function set value <coughs> this is this is this yeah. thing to remember it's like when you use the by keyword then your your expression needs to have these set value and and get value um properties when those happen to be uh, implemented as a as an extension function um then you might need to import them uh like explicitly, which is exactly what you ran in here uh, when when you did that, yeah. Right. So alt enter actually helps, so it was fine. Uh, so we have the canvas where we draw stuff, and we have the settings panel, and the settings panel is probably uh, the most relevant for those who either develop the desktop applications or mobile applications because we have some controls in there. So if we switch into the settings panel, we figure out that it's 
it's not actually a class, but it's actually a composable function. Um, so compose is a, a compiler plugin and uh, uh, you can only call the composable functions from composable functions, which is strange. How do you start then? But if you start looking into the application definition, you will get here and see that the signature of this function says that the block where we do do it all, like we call our other either our own composable functions or the ones from the compose library, they are actually called within the scope where which is composable itself. How do they do that further on? How they actually call this composable function within their block by not residing in a composable context? That's some sort of a compiler magic, I suppose. Yeah. I, I think I, it's I a bit of a, a mystery about the about the whole fact. Like this is it is exactly as you said, kind of the the magic, right? It's the the function coloring is something you know. It's a tale as old as time. It's when you have a suspend function, you can only call it from another suspend function unless you have a special other thing. Um, if you have a composable, <coughs> you can only call it from other composables. Uh, right. But yeah, yeah es yeah, essentially, yeah. yeah there's a th this kind of this entry point, I guess, is is part of. Uh, of just the, the the composed library itself yeah we just have to believe that it works right <laughs> yeah. it starts and it renders and uh the the um uh, the idea itself is pretty simple you only call the colored function from the colored function that's mm -hmm. it uh okay let's go back to our settings panel now so that was the function where we actually declare the layout for our controls that will be setting the values for the settings. Um, and there we have a lazy column, which is a standard control. The good part of it, uh, or the nice property of it, is that it only renders the part that is visible. So it can be scrollable. And it will only render the part uh, that is on your window screen. And uh, well, it's. It's, it wouldn't probably make uh, a big a big difference in my application here, but if you have a long list, then probably does. Uh, so next we have the items that we want to render. There is a number of them, like probably 10 or so. And on each item, we declare the elements that we want to place on our settings panel. Let's take a look at our settings panel on the right. We have a label that says that it's a settings panel. Then we have the individual labels for the uh, controls to you know to distinguish which which toggle we are going to use and so on. And and those are all the standard controls. What I found interesting is that the standard color for the switch button is green, and for the for 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 the um, how do you call it for the sliders. For the sliders, it's it's purple. But anyways, maybe the designers know it better. So <laughs> I, I'm just using everything default. I, I did not customize anything here. Uh, and basically, the list is rendered the way I uh, specify here. And, and all those slides, I do have some wrappers, like this property slider is actually uh, my, my own composable function. But at the very end, it just delegates to the standard slider. So I, I'm just using this convenience uh, function to group the uh, the labels and the sliders into one kind of one element and so on. Uh, so what else is interesting here? Um, yeah, and, and once, once it changes, we have this lambda or the action that should happen. We make a copy of the style, it actually should be called settings. Yes. We make a copy of the settings uh, and we overwrite the value with the new one, right? What, what, whatever we changed is going to take a new value and call the on value change function, which will actually wait. At the very end, it will, it will call the or trigger re rendering of our canvas anyway. 
Um, yeah, so and I think here here the beauty is again that that actually you don't really need to take care of uh, of that re-rendering uh, because you're you're all being very declarative. All you do is hey, this state is now a different object, and compose figures out that hey, that means I should probably re-render uh, the user interface. Right, and and so circles. so the aesthetics of it is kind of interesting. Is that uh, it's up to you to how, how you uh, generate it. But if you generate those figures, they are following some, some rules and they are regular. If you want to have irregularities in your final composition, you actually have to make it your, yourself. Like you would customly call a specific function that draws some a square somewhere on my drawing but it's mm -hmm. not generated. It's something that I have decided that I want to have a square somewhere on the screen next to the circles and it's not generated. Um, okay, but you can actually make your own rules, as I, as I said. Uh, you can uh, create your own compositions too. So for instance, uh, I have another example for you here uh like a glitch i call it a glitch let's zoom in a little bit so it's it's three orbits that we have here one is blue the other one is uh red and green and they're slightly shifted uh the the, the center of the orbits is slightly shifted like maybe five pixels which creates this interesting glitch let's say between yeah, the circles this is this is really cool because this uh, this reminds me a little bit of like what you have when you when you have like small lenses on cameras you have this chromatic ab aberration where like the the different channels of your sensors they kind of get get split apart and you're, you're kind of getting these these same vibes but i also just like the fact uh that that really like what you're doing is it's kind of like it's emergent right like it like all these things they just kind of appear from like a very small set of rules uh, which which is I guess also what just makes this really powerful. Right. But you can actually make it crazy complicated as well with the higher math, the graph theories, mm. matrices, whatever, right? <laughs> it, it's up to you. I, I'm not too good in math. So I'm 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 just good in drawing the circles and, and drawing the circles on top of circles, but I don't know the math behind it. Right. And maybe some other example like the one with hexagons uh so here like the hexagon if you didn't know is actually the simplest shape to get if you are drawing the circles because you can use the same radius and follow the orbit for uh for finding those points like we can we can actually demonstrate that with, with our oh, yeah. initial oh, yeah. example because we can uh, take one orbit, say that we want to have 60 as a step and the radius should be 60. And there we get this shape. And if we connect the intersections right here, they are going to be six. Oh. So this is how the hexagon comes to be. So if you if you uh, continue this pattern, you actually get a mesh of hexagons. And if you are add some, if you add some uh, more uh, dashed lines in between, you actually get a three D pyramid of cubes. Because if you add the diagonals into the hexagon, it becomes a three D cube in perspective. Oh, uh, I, I, I didn't cool. add this into my example, but maybe someone wants to contribute and, and draw it for me. So this shape that we can see here right now is actually called the seed of life in sacred geometry uh, area. Like some artists are, are very fond of uh, symbolics. So they call this symbol the seed of life. Anyways. That's a, I, and, I really like, I really like the, the, the fact that, that you're kind of like, because at this point we're not even just talking about circles anymore. Like, um, I, I remember that I briefly had a, like, 
I, I wanted to build some kind of game uh, with like with like hex tiles, right? Like you're seeing this a lot in, in games like Civilization and whatever. And there you're like, um, you really get deep into this whole idea of like, oh, this is like a different coordinate system. You can think about this as like 3D cubes um, and all these kind of things. So so working with uh, with this kind of stuff and kind of bringing it back to these basics. I didn't actually know you could just that easily construct the hexagons. I guess I never thought about them. But it's really cool. Right. And so in this other example that I have, the hexagons example, there is like some some math to divide the circle into any polygon. And I'm just, you know, dividing it into hexagons, but uh, and, and then randomly drawing them on the canvas. Uh, let's say how many of them do we have? Like 500 is probably too much. Let's have 100 uh, in the window and we get we get this. So you can imagine, actually, if you start playing with the layout, with the uh, orientation colors and so on, you may uh, may create or generate pretty interesting patterns that you might want to even print out and put it on the wall. Why not? <clears throat> so that was pretty much everything I wanted to show today. I hope that was interesting enough to get you interested <laughs> in in the creative coding and generating the figures by using Kotlin and Compose. Uh, and yeah, the, the, the repository is there so you can find and, and play with it. Yeah, so we're going to put that repository uh, back in the, in the chat again another time as well so that people can find it um, easily and, you know, draw a couple of circles or maybe a couple of hexagons on their own. Right. So uh, thank you everybody for coming and thanks Seb join, for joining me today. Uh, it wasn't announced, but well, why not? Why not? <laughs> hey, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a surprise guest. That's what that's what I do best. Yeah. I don't know. Um, we can have a very quick Q&A maybe just for, for a couple of minutes here. Um, just to yeah, see, sure. because of course we were we're quite busy here. Uh, Zeus asks, does de compose for desktop output executables for Linux, Mac, and Windows? Um, yeah. Oh, we we have like in the generated when when the project wizard generates the pro uh, the the configuration file for Gradle, we actually have uh, a task for that. I think. Yeah, there's so definitely I, something. Yeah. There should be something right in there. Yeah, um, I'm not. Yeah. Now you can see DMG, uh, so that's macOS. MSI, that's a Microsoft installer on on Windows, and DEB, that's your that's your Linux uh, package. Right. So that's quite nice. Uh, Ilya then also asked, can we add motion with coroutines and the delay function? And the answer for that is, uh, yeah, absolutely. Like essentially, what you can yeah, just do is not? like, yeah, yeah, like your. Um, Essentially, your UI is just a, um, a or your your visualization is just a function uh, of the state. So if you somehow automatically change the state over time, uh, that means that you're going to uh, kind of get a nice nice little animation going. That's absolutely possible. Um, let's or, see if or, a... or the way I did right now in our demos, I was changing the slider position and uh, I was calling re-rendering. So it's pretty much the same. Something has to re-trigger, or the loop probably has to re-trigger the rendering with the new coordinates or with the new inputs, and there you have it. Yeah. Um, Edwin asks, it looks like a lot of work <coughs> creating interfaces in a creative coding context. Are there ways to generate UIs from annotated settings classes? I, I haven't tried that, but it's an interesting idea and probably could be some sort of a utility or a Gradle plugin maybe. Yeah, so th I, I would also, I have to admit, I also don't know whether there's already something that exists for this, but this sounds like the classic case for like some basic code generation using, for example, KSP, Kotlin Symbol Processing, uh, where you read in um, the the structure of your um, of your settings class, um, and then you you output the the code that was written here uh, manually. Um, yeah. Let's see here. What other? Yeah. 
Oh, yes, exactly. Put the ad on, on in the background so that you can get a couple more followers uh, while I scroll yep. for a couple more yep. questions here. Um, let's see. Uh, the other question is, is in uh, is IntelliJ already using Compose anywhere? Um, and I guess the, I think I think the Maybe. best answer. Yeah, I think the best answer for this is uh, if you can tell, then they've done their job correctly. <laughs> um, yeah, we definitely have. So if you if you're using JetBrains uh, JetBrains toolbox, um, that application is entirely um, written in Compose. So the the tool that helps you install and update um, your your IDEs. I'm not sure uh, which parts of like the first party. Um, uh, IntelliJ is done yet. Maybe a couple of plugins are doing it. I'm not sure if you know anything else on this. Oh, you're still muted, Anton. Sorry, sorry, I I was muted. Yeah, uh, I I I don't know if they have anything in the platform. Most probably not, but maybe a few plugins. To be wow. fair, it sounds like it definitely is one of those things where again, I don't want to speak for the team. But it, it, I mean, if it's emulating the IntelliJ look and feel, it seems like it would be a, a natural progression towards introducing that. If not now, then uh, sometime soon in the future. All right. Uh, the other question from uh, SM is, can I create games with Compose? Mm. Well... Well, probably you need something for creating a game. Let's let's think what what it could be. Collision detection of the objects is probably one of those that you need actually in the games. Uh, I don't think we have it in in uh, compose. Yeah. So this, yeah, it it kind of depends a little bit on on how crazy you want to go. But Anton, if you want to pull, uh, I'm sending you something in the private chat here. If you want to pull up a repository. Um... You can uh, you can see that uh, a while ago, um, I s actually uh, I sat down and I built a little Asteroids application using uh, Compose for Desktop. And on the side there, um, there's also a a little um, a blog post linked a two part blog post that talks about uh, if you if you go to like the page, yeah, exactly. Um, Kind of how I how I built this one, which maybe is a is an interesting thing. Uh, to be fair, you have to be, I guess, a little bit uh, crazy uh, to do this. Uh, you have to write all the stuff yourself. We can also put this uh, link in the uh, in the chat here. Um, yeah, so you probably have to be a little so bit they... crazy to do it and build everything manually, but you can do it. <laughs> so the answer is yes, but you have to be creative. Exactly, and I mean that's the <coughs> point of this this show is to encourage people to to be more creative, yeah. right? Um, so, so mm -hmm. are there any more questions? Let me see here, but I think uh, we've got most things. Uh, does Compose Material Theme take into account different device scales, like on Windows, the typical one twenty five percent scale? I know that. The team has worked on supporting high DPI displays. Uh, so if you have like a 4K screen uh, that has a that has a different scale, that should work. I don't know how fine grained that is. I would assume it behaves correctly. If it's not, I would consider that a bug, and that's something that you could uh, log as an issue. Um. Yeah. Okay. Then the other questions are uh, or comment is one of my first Compose apps was a chess app. Uh, so you can definitely write games in Compose. Very nice, very good. Um, and then uh, of course the other big question that that people always have is will will Compose support Hot Reload for Android? That's probably a question towards the Compose team and not us. <laughs> um, right. You do get this little like preview feature um, that that yeah. kind of helps you do these things faster. Well, currently, well, today we played with it and it didn't really work the way we expected, but it's a early stage for, for this uh, support, I think, and uh, can take it back to the team and probably uh, figure it out what we did wrong or maybe it just isn't ready yet for, for previewing those elements in, in the desktop 
applications. Yeah. Right. So uh, we are severely over time this time, but it's the first time this year, and it was a casual, uh, casual session. So follow follow the updates. We're gonna have more webinars along these topics for creative coding. Maybe we can generate some animations. Maybe we can generate some music. Maybe we can make some games even. Why not? And uh, thanks again, Sebastian, for joining me today. And uh, have a nice Kotlin, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank